and we will go ahead and get started. Uh, this morning, we're going to be talking about knowing your biologicals and what they can or cannot do for you. A few housekeeping things that we have for today. We will be offering a one CCA credit that will be offered at the end of our webinar. Um, this session will be recorded and available at the agcrops.osu.edu uh, website to watch at a later date if you need to, but the CCA credits are only offered during the live session. If you have questions or comments, please feel free to submit those through the Q&A chat feature at the bottom of your screen. We will use this feature throughout. And if you have other questions, you are welcome to email me at hampton.297 at osu.edu. All right. And today's speaker is Mark Light. Uh, he is coming to us from Iowa State University. Our moderators today are Mark Bodicher, Chris Zoller, and myself, Jamie Hampton. We are all extension educators with The Ohio State University. And at this time, I am going to stop my share and turn it over to Dr. Light. Well, good morning. And, and thank you for all uh, getting up and, and jumping on this fine morning. So Jamie, just to ensure that I have um, the right screen shared, can you see it okay? Yes, it looks great. Excellent. <clears throat> so um, yeah, I'm gonna talk about biologicals today. And uh, this is a, I'll say a topic that has um, came and went several times, uh, at least through my career. Um, and right now we're on an, an upswing. It seems like there's a, a lot of interest in biologicals and what biologicals uh, can do for us. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so I guess what, how I'm approaching the topic uh, today is kind of just talking about what biologicals are, um, kind of what some of the I'll call them components, but categories would also be appropriate of these biologicals. Um, and they may give some examples as I do that um, of some field trials that have already been done um, that we have some, some basic understanding from. And then um, also then getting into how do we maybe test some of these biological products? Um, because I, I personally, I think that um, doing some on-farm testing of the biological products um, is a, a great way to get an understanding of how they're going to work uh, in an individual situation uh, environment uh, system. So that's that's kind of where we're um, where we're headed uh, over the next uh, hour or so. So um, biologicals, um, the, you know. So I'll say in the broadest sense um, of a definition for biologicals. Um, they're made from living or naturally occurring materials. And so um, these biologicals can also be chemically synthesized um, to be nature-like. Um, and so that's an important uh, factor to kind of keep in mind. So they, while we normally think of them as being natural or being derived from natural or living materials, um, they can be, so to speak, chemically created. Um, and a lot of times when we first started talking about biologicals, it was from the uh, standpoint of an integrated pest management strategy. And so um, we know that we have some of those um, opportunities with them for crop protection. Uh, but now um, in this latest round and, and maybe even in a couple iterations before, we started hearing more and more about um, using biologicals for nutrient availability and uptake growth, uh, uh, promoting um, or stimulating type properties, reducing plant stress and things like that, all in, a, all in an attempt to help us maximize yields. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so I, I'm using this graphic here because I think it does a, a pretty good job of kind of showing the, the breadth of what's going on here. Um, and so uh, I, I'm really gonna focus over here on, on the right-hand side of it. 
Um, and so we know that there's um, newer solutions coming down and, and becoming available for uh, biostimulants um, almost every year, it seems like. Um, and so we, we can kind of group them as um, controlling some abiotic stresses, but then also trying to promote um, plant health. Um, the other part of this, um, as, as we kind of think about how it's doing some of those things, um, you know, yield efficiency or higher yield potential always um, is almost always the end goal. Um, but some of how that happens is enhancing micronutrient absorption, uh, possibly even working with nutrient use efficiency, um, improving crop quality. So this would be things like uh, test weights, uh, maybe even helping us um, identify um, uh, certain products that would maybe target um, green composition or oil composition. And then uh, abiotic stress um, tolerance. And so uh, a lot of times what we think about here is um, too much water, not enough water, um, or high temperatures. Um, but also sometimes what, what uh, falls into that category occasionally is if we're maybe in a nutrient deficient type of a situation. And so trying to reduce some of those stresses, um, you, know, you know, allowing that plant to kind of overcome them. So um, as I kind of group the plant growth regulators, I start, or excuse me, the biologicals, I kind of start with plant growth regulators. And so uh, these plant growth regulators um, are naturally occurring uh, within the plant already, right? And so that um, kind of brings some hope as we as we talk about them, just because we know that these these plant growth regulators are in the plant. We know that they have a function uh, within the plant, right? Um, now the the interesting thing is is how how do each of them individually work, but then how do they work in synergy with each other? And uh, from a scientific level, we're still learning how um, they interact with each other and how they work in synergy. So the the first one is the um, auxins, right? And so that's uh, up here in the top right um, as far as the chemical chain. So these auxins stimulate cell elongation. They work to maintain root meristems. Um, they uh, are associated with elongation of hypocotyls and even uh, growth um, from those root meristems. Um, they're associated or they're found um, in the curvature of coleoptiles. Um, they're associated with apical dominance, uh, development of auxiliary buds, and even the initiation of um, flowers and fruits. Okay, so um, a lot of times when we think of uh, these auxins, again, it, it comes back to cell elongation. And so, um, you know, if we're using these products and we start seeing uh, elongation between nodes, um, that would be a sign that that maybe they did something to the plant, right? So the plant got taller. They didn't necessarily put out more nodes, but it would maybe have elongated between the nodes a little bit more, okay? Um, then as we kind of move into the, the gibberellins, and that's the chemical chain right there in the bottom center, these uh, gibberellins um, again, they are associated with elongation. And so again, kind of like the auxins, they're going to elongate uh, between the nodes. Um, it, the gibberellins also induce uh, the rosette uh, plants um, like lettuce and cabbage and canola, and, and it helps them initiate and regulate the formation of the flowers. Um, and so that, that would be kind of when we go from the rosette into kind of a bolting um, stage. Um, and so we can, well, while well, I note that it's the rosette plants like the lettuces and cabbage and the, the canolas, um, all of our plants um, kind of um, benefit from that. And it's that elongation um, that's, that's occurring there. Okay. And again, these gibberellins, um, like the auxins, help with the formation of fruits uh, and that fruit growth. And so when we think about corn or soybeans, you know, it's that ear, it's the, the pod and the seeds um, that we're really talking about there. Um, and in some species where we're worried about dormancy, um, the gibberellins help us break dormancy and can facilitate germination, but that, that's less likely in the small grains, corn and soybeans. And then um, 
The next one is the cytokinins, and so that's the chemical chain there on the, the left-hand side. Um, and so these cytokinins, um, this is the cell division uh, portion or, or the hormone that regulates cell division. Um, and so we can get some increased sprouting of lateral buds. Um, it can be an antagonist to some of the auxins. Um, and so uh, when you think about that, uh, you know, a, a good example would be like with soybeans. And so um, if we're trying to um, use cytokinins, what that would maybe do is help us initiate those auxiliary buds and, and help them form into um, the branching of, of those soybeans. They can um, retard senescence or slow down senescence. And so um, the timing of the use of cytokinins is, is really critical. Um, because we don't necessarily want to push um, our, our crops into maturing any earlier, right? So we want maybe want to think about how can we utilize cytokinins in a, in a very timely fashion um, to maybe potentially get some of the um, in, you know, lateral buds or the auxiliary buds to, to shoot. How do we get some of that cell division to occur when we, when we could really use it? And then the uh, last one that I have on here is abscisic acid, and that's the lower right uh, um, uh, chain there. Um, and this uh, helps us regulate water balance, um, and, and it's through the stomata um, opening and closure. Um, and, and so really what we think about it as is maybe a stress release mechanism, uh, because we can use that to help us close down stomata when we have um, drought conditions. Uh, it, it, or um, maybe not having the, the timely rains that we need. So it can help us regulate that water usage and, and transpiration. Okay. Um, the abscisic acid does also play a role in seed maturation, um, and that's combined with ethylene. And so again, um, th this gets a little bit tricky, right? Because we don't want to, we don't want to speed up the plants into maturity, right? Um, and so if we're thinking of uh, drought conditions and using that, at least in Iowa, a lot of times we think of our drought conditions being in July and August, and we don't want to necessarily use it for stress protection there, uh, especially if we get too late, because then that can uh, push us into uh, maturing a little bit earlier than maybe we would want. Now, there are um, other naturally uh, occurring um, growth regulators or hormones within the plant. And so I've already mentioned like ethylene, um, but there's um, jasmonic acid, there's uh, various peptides, there's uh, salicylic acid, um, several of them um, that come into play here. And so you may hear about some of those, um, you know, as, as various people talk about these plant growth regulators and how they maybe work. So, you know, again, just uh, diving a little bit deeper, and I've kind of already talked about um, these different categories, so I'll go through this slide really quickly um, because I, I, I don't necessarily want to repeat myself, but just wanting you to start to see some of the connections uh, between, uh, you know, the, these main uh, growth regulators. And so, again, you have the auxins. They're going to help you with that cell elongation. Uh, the cytokines, uh, more toward uh, cell division, okay? Uh, the the gibberellins, um, that's going to be that uh, internodal elongation. And then the abscisic acids, um, those are maybe where we could see some of the benefits as far as um, some stress reduction um, in, in helping us regulate kind of water balance and water use by a plant. Okay. And then just to, to highlight again that, um, that these plant growth regulators um, they're basically regulating from within in the plant, right? Um, and so we don't necessarily have the ability um, to uh, have them uh, helping uptake nutrients or water and some of those types of things uh, from the soil environment, right? And so think of these growth regulators, think of these plant growth regulators as really being able to um, help that plant um, function like it already is, except for in heightening certain characteristics of that plant growth and development. Okay, so just summarizing this, this section a little bit, um, you know, with the plant growth regulators, I always mention that, you know, are we really working toward plant health or plant yield? Um, and so I think the, 
the idea here is that yes, we want plant yield and we want to make sure that we have a healthy plant that leads us to optimizing our, our yield potential, right? Um, but I would say also, if you're going out in your fields and you have healthy plants, then are you going to really see any benefit from the use of plant growth regulators? Now, if you're seeing um, stunted plants or if you're seeing uh, lethargic growth, things like that, there is the potential that some of these plant growth regulators could help you, okay? Um, and then this is gonna be a reoccurring theme, but some things are probably gonna change in this statement, but you have to use the right product um, to get the result that you're looking for. Um, and so if you're looking for maybe increasing emergence or that early growth, um, the gibberellins and the cytokinins are, are probably okay to at least look at. Um, th these may help us when we get into some cool wet conditions even. Um, if you're looking for kind of the reproductive development or at least the early reproductive development, um, so setting of pods, um, even the beginning part of seed fill, um, uh, flowering, pollination in corn, you know, then maybe we turn toward some of the auxins or the cytokinins, okay? And so, it, you know, as I, as I look at this, it kind of says, you know, look at some of those products and evaluate when, you know, when do they, when do they want it to be applied, right? So if you're applying auxins at the time of planting, either as a, you know, as a, a starter type um, application or in furrow, they're probably not going to have as much benefit to you because we know that they are kind of working more so um, on the reproductive development and initiation of those reproductive structures. Okay, so think about the, the kind of the timing that's being suggested and, and then the purpose of some of those plant growth regulators and do they match up? Okay, so I think I went one too far. There we go. Um, so a, a product that um, I actually have, have used or did a, a test on um, here in Iowa is uh, this Rise Up Smart Grass. Okay, and so I'm not necessarily promoting any uh, particular um, uh, product here. I'm just using it to illustrate some, some points, and I'll continue to do that a little bit. Um, and so with this Rise Up Smart Grass, um, again, look through the label and understand what you're, what you're seeing. And so with Rise Up Smart Grass, um, you have uh, gibberellic acid. And so that's what's uh, functioning here. And so kind of go back in and think about, okay, so what is that gibberellic acid going to do for us? Um, and so unfortunately, I don't have um, great pictures from this uh, other than uh, just my, my observations. But in the trial that we used uh, gibberellic acid um, in this uh, Rise Up Smart Grass, um, we did have taller plants. And so at, um, we were measuring plant height at the fourth leaf stage of corn. And so we did have taller plants. They were, you know, two to three inches taller than where we did not apply the smart grass. The, the other part of that is, is that while, yes, we did get taller plants, they were also considerably um, less green or, or, or more of a yellow tint to them than uh, where we had uh, no, no gibberellic acid, no smart grass, right? So there was a trade-off there. We got a little bit more growth, but the, the nutrient um, translocation within the plant maybe had slowed down a little bit or just wasn't able to keep up with that growth. And so, um, you know, when we think about it, um, kind of, we have to be observational as well to kind of understand what just happened to the plant and did we really gain any benefit from it? In, in my situation, uh, we did not see any yield benefits from it, right? It was, it, was, it was something that we've seen early in the growing season, but by the time we got out to harvest, there was no statistical differences between where we used it and where we did not. An, another product here that kind of fits into this uh, category of plant growth regulators is uh, Radiate. And again, I'm I, showing it uh, more to, to illustrate what we've got going on here. And so this is um, an IBA, uh, basically a butric acid. And I didn't talk too much about those earlier, but it is another one of those hormones that's naturally occurring within the, within the plant. Um, and I use this slide because I think that there's some things with these that we do have to pay attention to as far as, you know, obviously the application rates and timings, um, but then we do have to, um, 
we do have to think about the compatibility. Um, and so are these products compatible with liquid fertilizers? Are they compatible with uh, herbicides? And most of the plant growth regulators are going to be compatible with liquid fertilizers. They may or may not be compatible with some of the, the herbicides that we're using. And so make sure, uh, kind of pay attention to the label on those. Okay, I'm gonna switch gears here. I'm gonna move to um, kind of the humic and fulvic acids. And so this is kind of that category, you know, that I, I sit back and I say, um, when we think and classify biologicals, most people are not thinking about the humic and fulvic acids, uh, but they do fit that definition because they're derived from um, essentially uh, ancient organic matter. And so it's derived from the uh, Leonardic shale, um, which is um, basically you've got um, sediment layers that are have basically compressed um, and those various layers between those layers is ancient organic matter. Okay, and so there's different properties uh, between these. And so generally speaking, these tend to be about 50% carbon and about 40% um, uh, oxygen or the, the O2 molecule. Okay, and so they do contain a little bit of hydrogen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. Mo most of the time, they're not going to have a guaranteed analysis for the phosphorus and sulfur because they're so low. Even the nitrogen, they won't have it. Now, sometimes they will because what they're trying to do is um, trying to get them classified as uh, a fertilizer rather than um, some some sort of um, soil amendment, depending on the, the various states. And so sometimes you will see humic and fulvic acids, you know, basically with that guaranteed analysis um, showing there. Okay. Um, when we think about the, the, whoops, I wanna, yeah. So when we think about uh, the humic and ful fulvic acids, again, make sure that you're, you're not really considering them as a fertilizer, right? Um, these are likely going to be helping us stimulate nutrient availability or nutrient uh, uptake. Um, it could you know, even be helping us a little bit um, with the cycling of nutrients. Um, but where, where these can really help us shine a little bit is you know, the chelates of uh, met, uh, metal ion, excuse me, <laughs> metallic ions, um, maybe even some oxidizing and, and um, hydroxides uh, of those nutrients. Um, and so uh, in Iowa, where we sometimes hear the use of humic and fulvic acids is in association with high pH soils that have high carbonates. Um, and so then we um, typically find ourselves deficient uh, with uh, iron, actually. And so it's an iron deficiency chlorosis um, uh, that, that occurs. And so sometimes these uh, humic and fulvic acids uh, can help us um, provide some chelated iron uh, for you know, basically overcoming that deficiency. Um, and then they, they do, because they're really high in carbon, um, they can help us definitely increase uh, cation exchange capacity. And so there's a, a number of things there that do, uh, do sometimes make sense for us. Um, now, the thing with the humic and fulvic acids that I would um, very openly state is, if you're dealing with soils that are high in organic matter, and I would generally say if you're one, two percent or higher, these fulvic acids may not have as much um, applicability for you because you've already got a lot of organic matter, which means you've got a lot of nutrient cycling, a lot of nutrient holding capacity, water holding capacity. And so the humic and fulvics um, are, are just less likely to uh, be responsive for you. Um, I think that generally speaking, they're gonna do a little bit better in low organic matter situations or where we have um, sandier uh, soils. Okay, um, and so uh, one of the products that has been um, tested relatively frequently here in Iowa uh, in particular is a product called Yield Igniter. Um, and um, a, a common theme across not just this product, but a lot of them is that you're gonna find that they say that they're a proprietary blend, that there's some patented um, processes in there. And so again, just, just be aware of that, that sometimes you may not know um, everything that's going on because they're gonna, they're gonna couch it and it's a proprietary blend. And so they may not tell you with 100% all of what the active ingredients are. 
Now, having said that, um, this product does, you know, talk about it having humic and fulvic acids, uh, plus a little bit of nitrogen and phosphorus there. And so, um, yeah, so th that's this product. A colleague of mine um, did some testing on it. Um, and so he was using the, the humic acid product. And so um, this, this product here on soybeans, anyhow, we had um, two years, or excuse me, three years, four different locations. Um, and then he had different uh, application timings here, right? So he had very early growth and then uh, kind of comes out to mid growth uh, at flowering time. And then uh, once we get out into to full flower, right? And so the, the key here is that um, we get, we, again, we have to be very careful because in this situation, we had two, two site years. So Ames and Boone in 2013 and 2014, where there was no differences um, in yield when we used it versus when we did not. Uh, in Sheridan of, in 2012, the V2 application was statistically greater than the control. But then, you know, within a week, all of a sudden we don't see any differences showing up again. Okay. So very inconsistent in how it performed, right? We get a, a response on the early side, but then it, it goes non-responsive. And then in Boone in 2012, again, we had a nice response at the V2 growth stage of soybeans. V4, um, our yield response wasn't there. Um, and then V6 uh, and V, or excuse me, R2, all of a sudden we did get a response again. Um, and so, 2012 was obviously the year that we had kind of the best response um, and, and maybe some, some consistency across application times. But then when we look at 2012 in Sheridan, we didn't get a response after, uh, the v, after the V2 application and then 2013 and 2014, nothing, right? So um, this is one of the challenges that we often have when we look at um, biologicals in general is um, we, we get very inconsistent uh, responses to them. So we may get it in one year, but we may not get it in other years. Um, the same, uh, same project or product, um, actually it's a different um, lead author here, but it's the same, same uh, faculty group that was doing some research on um, the, the humic acids in corn. Um, and so we have uh, five site years uh, here in Iowa uh, with this one. Um, 2010, um, it was a very responsive year. So whether it was at a pre-emergence, whether it was at V3 or V6, we got a, a yield response from it. Uh, 2011, um, now we lost a little bit of consistency, even though, um, so V3 was no different than the control, but it was, you know, it was numerically maybe just a little bit higher. Um, you know, so again, now we start to see some of that inconsistency show up in in uh, the Radcliffe of, of 2011. Whereas in White and Conrad uh, in 2010 and 2013, right, there's just no yield differences between where we use the product and where there was uh, no product or, or a control uh, at, right? So again, um, we, we do see that maybe there is some promise, but we're not finding the consistency. And so why are we not finding that consistency? Um, and then, some uh, on-farm trials associated with this uh, product. Um, you know, these, these figures remind me of um, some of the, the fungicide piano graphs that, you know, we're used to seeing on, on fungicide responses, right? And so um, the way to kind of look at this is uh, we have each of the panels there's, is a different year. So 2009, 2010, and then 2011. And the, the kind of the main line where you have the up or down uh, split coming, that is the, the zero uh, bushel increase. And so, um, excuse me, I shouldn't, shouldn't say bushels, it's uh, megagrams of grain per hectare. So it's gonna show you the kind of the range of what's going on there. Um, and so um, there are some non-responsive and then all of a sudden you get some responsive um, and this is in on-farm trials um, and so, why are we getting those responses? Um, unfortunately, one of the challenges with on-farm trials often is that um, we're, we do a very good job of detecting kind of what the yield response is, 
but we don't go into, uh, or we don't go very deeply into why did we get responses at one location, but not at another. Um, so we just don't gather enough information to, to really understand um, where these can consistently be used and, and have positive responses versus where we, where we lose that consistency at. Okay, so um, a different product, and this is uh, some trials that I did with um, some fulvic acids. And so this um, was a, a experimental product um, out of actually out of Japan. Um, so we tested it in, in Southwest Iowa near Atlantic where we have slightly lower organic matters, um, better drained soils. And so kind of looking to see if it, if it really did anything from a, a water holding capacity or um, looking at the, the soil microbiome um, cation exchange capacity. Um, and so in the two years that we did it, um, and we had different rates each year, I, I will acknowledge that, right? But when I look at it, statistically, there was no yield difference across the treatments. Uh, definitely none of the treatments had a higher yield, statistically higher yield than the uh, zero control. Now in, in uh, 2020, the one liter per hectare, which is, is um, roughly a, a quart an acre, um, you know, kind of shows up maybe a, that there's some numerical differences there. Uh, we just weren't able to detect it statistically. Um, in 2021, um, when we look at it, the kind of the lower um, side of the applications had some numerical difference, but again, they weren't statistical. And so um, how come maybe we were seeing some indications there, but we just couldn't, um, could couldn't get them separated out. You know, why was why was there um, different things going on there? So was it uh, environments? Was it just variability across the the plot area? Um, was there something uh, showing up with the the product itself? Um, and then this one here um, was uh, 2021, same product. Uh, we we tried it in uh, soybeans, and we had absolutely no. A yield response. Um, we had a really high yielding uh, environment, obviously, um, when we we're averaging uh, just over 80 bushels per acre. So um, is, is a high yielding environment um, with very few yield limiting factors, is that really a, an environment that we'd expect to see a yield response? And, and the answer is kind of no. Um, although if I could always guarantee my, my yield levels at the beginning of the year, I would, I, you know, can always pick different places to, to put these trials to, to see if we can elucidate, um, get some uh, better uh, responses out of them, right? So um, very inconsistent results when it comes to the humic and, and fulvic acids, at least here in Iowa. I would also state that most of these locations, uh, even uh, Atl the, the Southwest Iowa area by Atlantic, um, we're still looking at one to one and a half or even two uh, percent organic matters there. Um, and so maybe our organic matter levels were were just to a you know a high enough level that uh, we weren't able to see the response from these um, humic and fulvic acids. Okay, uh, just looking at um, kind of a summary here, and this um, gets us and starts bridging us to this soil health versus plant yield um, uh, dynamics again, right? And so um, have to kind of uh, balance that and. and Kind of look in, and decide what our goals are there. Uh, if we're looking for some of the, the soil health properties um, that may help us stimulate some uh, plant growth and, and yield potential, there is some, um, some hope here that the humic and fulvic acids can, can be of benefit. Um, <clears throat> again, making sure that we're kind of paying attention to the product and, and where we're going to see um, the results that we're, we're hoping for, right? And so I think if we're looking for uh, nutrient uptake, if we have lower uh, cation exchange capacities, you know, this is a, a product that may be able to help us, right? Um, another area, you know, that we may get some potential from the humic and fulvic acids is if we have low soil organic matter, if we have degraded uh, fields um, and things like that. Okay. Um, Moving on, um, microbials. And so this is, you know, at least in, in this latest round of um, our products, in, 
as far as a biological category, the microbials are, <coughs> excuse me, the microbials are um, kind of the hot, the hot topic right now. And so these are generally living organisms, but not always. Um, and so when, when we think about the, the, the partial list, or as I show you the partial list here, um, I think we have to really be careful um, with these, right? Because there's a number of different things that are going on. <clears throat> there's a number of different things that are going on depending on the type of organism that we have. <clears throat> so here we have, as I just kind of look at it, we have a number of uh, bacteria that come into play. We have some, um, some fungal um, species there as well. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so a lot of these are fungal species. We have some mycorrhizal um, in there and some, uh, some others, um, algae. Uh, for example. So kind of look at some of the classifications of these and just determine kind of what are they going to do for us. And I haven't necessarily broken that down for each species or group of species because uh, as you look at some of the products, there's a lot of differences that come into play uh, there. And so um, we just have to be, be careful as we look at those and kind of understand, okay, so what are they really supposed to be doing for us? And so again, read, read into the literature and and kind of say, for the product um, labels and say, so what, what actual microbes are in here? Um, I get really cautious myself when it says it's a proprietary blend of microbes and it doesn't tell you what, they're, what they are. Um, that, that scares me a little bit because um, I think we should just be a little bit more forthcoming about what, what the actual microbes are. Um, so that way uh, farmers and agronomists can be more informed about what they're using and they can dig back in and say, okay, so if, if this is the suite of uh, microbes that I, that I have in a product, what are they going to do for me? And then you can go from there and say, well, if they're doing X, Y, and Z, is that what I really need? <clears throat> so as I looked at a handful of labels, um, well, several handful of, of labels, um, these are the type of terminologies that that you would you would find. Um, so um, you know, one, one label just simply said, you know, we're adding more bacteria to the soil. Okay, so what is that bacteria going to do for us? Um, and we know that, that the microbial um, populations um, need a food source. Um, a lot of times we think that we have it in the sense of our residue. Uh, the other part of that food source is we have to have some nitrogen available, right? Um, soil structure, water infiltration, um, there's a host of them that talk about fixing nitrogen or mineralizing nitrogen, getting into the, the nitrogen nutrients, uh, or even uh, phosphorus use efficiencies, um, some things like that. Um, we know that there are some species that are antagonistic, and so uh, Pythium and Fusarium can be um, an can antagonize at times, right? So they are a, a pest of, uh, well, different species of them can be a pest of both uh, corn and soybeans. And so we have to be a little careful about that. Um, and then we also know that some of these are, you know, and this goes back to, you know, a statement I made at the very beginning, right? You know, so we first started thinking about um, some of these biologicals from a pest control standpoint. So could we put on these uh, biologicals to um, have a healthier plant because it's protecting us from um, naturally occurring uh, pests you know, pressures, whether it be um, uh, some of our bacterial or our fungal uh, disease pathogens. Um, sometimes we can use some of these uh, biologicals to help us with some of our insect pests. Um, and then um, we get into a host of what I would call um, plant health um, type things um, as far as promoting growth, uh, in, improving root growth and structure and, and some of that seedling growth stands and so on. But ultimately, a lot of them talk about, we're gonna get down here to the very bottom and, and we're gonna protect yield, we're gonna increase yields, thing, things like that. So there's, there's a whole host of, of, of these products um, and, and, and different biologicals out there. So kind of understanding what you're gonna get um, with the individual products that, that you're considering. <clears throat> so, uh, through the years, I've done, a, again, a number of, of trials with various um, microbes. 
Um, and so this was an experimental and, and I wanted to show it to you largely because while well, with experimentals, um, they really start getting at um, not only does the product itself work, but when is it going to work for us? So is it going to work better as, uh, in this case, uh, like a, a foliar uh, application during the vegetative stages? Um, is it going to be used or should it be used as a liquid seed treatment? Do we need to use it as, as a combination of, you know, kind of a, a liquid seed treatment versus a, a foliar? Uh, a dry seed treatment, a dry seed treatment of foliar, um, or do we, you know, potentially use it as a inferro type product? Um, <clears throat> and so uh, when we tested this one, statistically, we didn't have any yield differences across the board, right? But you can clearly see that there are some uh, yield trends that are showing up here. And so like the, the liquid seed treatment uh, numerically was, was quite high. Uh, the dry seed treatment uh, with the, the foliar was another one that was quite a bit higher, right, numerically. Statistically, we weren't there, uh, which then gets us uh, into thinking about it. And as I look at the, the actual raw data, um, when we use the product, there is a lot of variation in that response. Um, so uh, we do replications. And so um, the control had very tight um, data around the replications, but then all of these uh, different treatments um, had uh, quite a lot of variability um, from one replication to the next. And so that just goes to uh, highlight that, again, the consistency is what we're really needing to look for. And in some cases, we're just not going to get that consistency. Um, same product, um, again, just testing it, kind of looking at it on the soybean side of things. Um, again, we have some liquid uh, seed treatments, uh, dry seed treatments uh, with foliar, in furrows, and then we start getting some of those various combinations, right? Um, in this situation, um, again, we had a, a pretty high yield potential at 75 bushels or a little bit more per acre. But as you look across the board, um, all of those products um, held back yield potential, right? And so, again, they're non-statistical, but <clears throat> there, there was enough variation and, and, you know, kind of if we look at this liquid seed treatment alone or the dry seed treatment with the foliar, um, again, looking at the individual data, you know, an individual treatment maybe had um, some, some good yield potential to it and, and maybe comparable with that control. But then when we really dive in across all those replications, there was enough replications that pulled back yield potential as well. And so, again, um, finding where we can where we can find some of that consistency um, you know, as far as how well they're going to perform for us is going to be a real big key. Okay, um, and so this is a um, Invicta, and so this is a, a known product uh, that we have out there. Um, this was done at one of our research farms um, up in northeast Iowa, and they were playing around with different hybrids, um, and then they had a couple different uh, plant populations. And so um, as you kind of look at it, I'll say through the diagonal, um, you can see that, yeah, there were hybrid differences. There um, wasn't really any plant population differences. Um, but when we looked at the Invicta versus the control, there, there was a, you know, a statistical difference, but it wasn't the difference that we wanted to see, right? So uh, the Invicta was 190 bushels per acre, whereas the, the no Invicta control was 200 bushels per acre, right? So we, we kind of lost out there when we just look at main effects. Uh, if we start looking at the interaction effects, um, there's nothing that's statistical there. So again, um, that helps us be able to just jump right over and look at, is there a kind of a difference there uh, between the Invicta and, and the non-Invicta control? Um, and so um, that, that's a, a key to kind of pay, pay attention to. Um, at the same point, we had some on-farm trials as well. Um, and so this is kind of a, a summary of those on-farm trials where we have uh, the zero Invicta control, and then we applied the Invicta. If the difference over here is negative, it meant that the control was higher yielding. Um, and so you can see that we had um, four of them where the control was higher yielding, one where they were the same, 
and then one where the Invicta was higher yielding. Statistically, that one that had a, a six bushel advantage for Invicta, um, that one was the only one that was statistically different. All the others were non-statistically different, okay? And so again, when we, when we put this out into a field environment, we've seen, we've seen those negative responses coming out, um, similar to what we've seen at the research farm, but we did have one where we had a, a positive response to it. And so um, makes us sit back and think about, okay, so how do we, um, again, look at the consistency of these? Okay, I'm gonna um, move on and, and run into a summary here. Um, and so one thing I would say with the biological summary is one thing that we've learned is more is not always better. Um, and so um, kind of follow the, the labeled rates because if you do get too high of a rate that can have a negative effect for you. Um, <clears throat> we have to pay attention to the timing, uh, the application and the storage of these products. Um, on the application uh, side of it, um, I've, I've denoted we have to pay attention to water source and maybe even some water conditioners. Um, so chlorinated waters with microbials are generally um, going to um, negate the use of those microbials. The chlorine all actually um, potential has the potential to uh, kill those microbes. Um, the water conditioners um, is kind of thinking about uh, the pH of that water and trying to adjust it again to make sure that we if we have a live microbial that we put that um, product together and, and apply it in a way that we maintain the survival of the microbe. Okay, and again, um, sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. So kind of pay attention to that. And, and this um, statement actually leads us into kind of the next, <laughs> next uh, section of this, um, of this presentation, right? And so, yeah, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. Um, especially when we start looking at them in research uh, trial settings. Um, now, I, I may not have always, in this presentation, sounded optimist, <clears throat> optimistic or supportive, but I do think biologicals in general do have potential, right? I've seen the greenhouse data. I've seen some of the controlled environment testing, and these products in those controlled environments do show the potential to, to help us. Now, the key is once we get them out into an uncontrolled environment, your, your farm fields, right? Um, can we get that consistency? Can we get the responses that we want? Um, and so sometimes, um, you know, we're, we're, we're very blessed to have research farms to do research on. The downside is, is that we have the, the soils, we have the organic matter, we have the local conditions, you know, that's associated with those, those research farms. And so I think it's really important that we kind of sit back and we say, okay, um, we have inconsistent data from a research farm perspective. What happens when you pull it out to an on-farm trial uh, where we're working in your um, cropping system with the, the management practices that you're using? We're using kind of your, your equipment, right? We're at field scale. And then we have, you know, your um, soils, we have your uh, environment, right? So I think there's a lot of uh, benefit to kind of jumping in and saying, how do we test these things, you know, in a on-farm environment? And so the, the easiest way to approach this is, you know, just a basic strip trial design. So you have a, a plus and you have a minus, you know, so you have the standard control being that minus and the plus is you're, you're now using that biological product at the recommended or the labeled application rates and, and kind of following some of that guidance, right? So doing those strip trials, um, multiple replications, don't just split a field in half or, you know, do, you know, alternating quarters of that field, you know, really look at um, doing, um, doing multiple replications. Um, I always recommend four to six for on-farm trials. Um, we just know that on-farm trials, we have inherent variability across the field. And so um, let's, let's take advantage of that by getting more replications. So that way we can do some spatial analysis uh, as well. Okay. Um, and then we have to make sure that, you know, how we set these up, we're matching the equipment, right? So if it's a foliar product, you know, we have to keep in mind what is the width of the sprayer versus the, 
the width of the planter versus the width of the combine, right? And so we have to make sure all those things uh, align so that way we can harvest within a treatment, right? We don't want to uh, be splitting treatments uh, in that harvest because it, it ruins kind of the, the, the trial and the outcomes of that trial, okay? And then the other thing is because sometimes we do end up with some complexity here, um, I, I do always recommend, you know, reach out to um, your, your extension services, uh, even reach out to industry. Um, some of these agronomists and, and crop advisors are really helpful and can really help you get these set up and, and implemented. Um, even if it's, you know, just kind of writing in the, the tractor, writing in the sprayer to, to help you know, okay, turn it on, turn it off type thing. Because we know once you're in the heat of the moment, um, you're paying attention to not just, you know, whether you need the treatment turned on or off, you're paying attention to how, how everything else is performing with that, uh, with that application or with that, with that seeding. Um, again, I, I can't stress enough the randomization and replication um, because that's really gonna help us um, take into account the variability across the field. It's really gonna help us understand whether there's you know, background noise or whether you know, it's inherent um, variability with a product, things like that. So I, I really think that there's um, some, some really good value in making sure that we do this randomization of the treatments, the replication out there uh, to make sure that we get good data that we can look at in a, in a very um, statistical, uh, well, statistically appropriate way. Um, just some some plot layouts here, um, just to highlight, you know, kind of the how do you do or how do you deal with um, that randomization and replication. And so on the left hand side, it's just a, a true treatment, right? So the yellow is no product and the blue is with the product. And so, you know, we have basically one plot with, excuse me, one plot without, two with, two without, two with, and one uh, without, right? So we have kind of that randomization, we have the four replications in there. Um, and then on the right hand side is a little bit more complicated because there's more colors, which means more treatments. And so how do we start randomizing and replicating across that? And I think, again, there's ways to do it. It just gets us a little bit more complicated. It may mean we need to use that uh, buddy seat to help us, you know, keep track of where we're at um, as we go along. Um, and then again, I've, I've mentioned statistics several times. Um, uh, I have a, a number of colleagues that um, usually during a master's or a PhD defense, we, we sit down and we, we talk about, oh, how did you do this statistically? And, and did you do it, you know, in an appropriate way? Um, and so I think there is a lot of value in understanding statistics. And we generally are looking at a p-value. Um, and so that p-value is basically telling, is, telling us, is there a difference or not? Um, at, a, at a certain level. And so scientifically, we often use a 0.5 um, level uh, for significance. Uh, sometimes we'll go to a 0.1. And so what we're saying is that we're 95% or 90% certain that the treatment differences um, are there uh, versus um, something in, uh, tied up in variability or um, no treatment differences, right? And so um, I think that that's a good a good way to kind of look at this. But again, there's a lot of different ways to do statistics. And so we can make our statistics look like anything we want um, at times. And I, I say that, but I, I mean, I think we really have to look at it from an unbiased perspective and say, how do we really analyze these things uh, in a simple way, but in a very valid way? And I think that's what most um, um, of us are trying to do in, you know, in a land grant university and an extension type role. And so, again, reach out to um, people in extension because they can help you with some of these statistics to help you understand where these true differences or where these kind of hidden differences. Okay, and, and my last slide, and then I'll open it up for questions here, um, you know, is really, again, just know what you're using, read the label, and then maybe do some testing, right? Um, I, I'm optimistic about a lot of these products because I think there are some benefits. Uh, we just have to figure out how to use them appropriately, how to use them so we get consistent results. Okay. Um, yeah, do we have any any questions that have came in on the, the chat? 
Yeah, Mark, uh, we have uh, six questions that have came in through the Q&A. And uh, the first question is, are there any risks with using PGRs and the timing which they are applied? Um, so yes, um, some of you are probably all too aware of what are some of those risks, right? So 2,4-D and dicamba are plant growth regulators, okay? And so we, we know that if you have too high of a rate or at the wrong time, that those are gonna really impact your yields. Um, we also know that if that drift is maybe not as severe, um, in, in some situations, in some environments, there may even be a nice benefit to it, right? Um, but we have not been able to predict, you know, especially with 240 and Dicamba, we haven't been able to predict when can we get those consistently good results, right? Um, so that's maybe an extreme example. Um, I know, you know, going back 10, 10 years or so, there's a lot of talk about using uh, Cobra to stress soybean plants to help them um, put out more nodes, put out more branches. Um, and I would say that, well, obviously, uh, most people have learned that that was not a good uh, experience, right? Um, so we, we know that, yes, plant growth regulators um, have some potential, but we're, again, we're not finding the the um, the best timing or the best rates of those to be able to use and get really good consistent results. Okay. The second question is, um, how did weather or rain affect the applications? Yeah, how does weather or rain affect those um, applications? Um, yeah, so I, th I think there is an interaction there, but we don't have enough good data that's really looked at that, right? Um, and so I think in, in part, if we think about some of those applications, and I'm going to stick more to the foliars, if we get rain, it's going to um, potentially uh, wash it off the plant if it already hasn't been absorbed into the plant. Um, if it's a foliar that we're really trying to get down into the soil to activate on the roots, um, the rain can also then help dilute that, right? So some of these are going to be um, I'll call them leachable. They're going to be mobile uh, with rainfall, um, whereas others are going to be a little bit more stable. And so I think we just have to be um, a little careful with those. And, and it's an area that we just need to do a little bit more research on to get a better understanding. Okay. Our third question uh, is a little bit on economics. Uh, when you saw a yield response, was it enough to pay for the product that was applied? Um, yes, and I'm, I'm glad you asked that question because, um, well, yeah, we, we need to make sure that we're getting an economic uh, return on that investment, right? Um, so some of these products are quite inexpensive. And so if you look at some of the premium seed treatments out there, they typically are including some sort of a biological. Um, you know, the, the base form is maybe looking at... Um, on the soybean side, some seed treatments that have uh, inoculants in them. And those are a biological, right? So that may only be costing you a dollar an acre or $2 an acre. So the yield response that you need is gonna be much less. Uh, some of these are much more expensive. Um, and, and so then that's just requiring a higher yield response, right? Um, oftentimes I can't, um, I have a hard time getting you know, the, the product cost. Uh, from the, the companies that I've tested things with. Part of that's because of um, their, them being experimental in nature. The other part is, is that, um, you know, the, well, so in some cases they've donated the product because that way they don't have to disclose how, how much they're costing me, you know, type thing. Um, and it, I think it, it comes back to is they're, they're, they do market a little bit based on how big is the operation and and is it a, is it a large sale versus a small sale? And so there's some differences that go on there. So no, I have not looked at, at truly the economics uh, behind it, um, but I think it's very important that we start to look at that as well. That's where those on-farm trials might be very helpful. Okay, moving on. Um, in addition to the data being shared, is there any data or work to show impact or changes to the soil microorganisms, specifically from these biologicals? So 
we're, we're starting to get into that because of the soil health uh, emphasis that's, that's going on really across the country. Um, I did a trial with our uh, uh, soil scientists in our department. Um, I was looking at the plant growth side and he was looking at the soil side of it. Um, and, and what we basically found was, and this was a seed treatment um, product, um, we did not find it to, to change the, the soil microorganisms. Um, and, and partly because, or at least our reasoning behind that was, is because it was at such a small amount, um, especially compared to what's natively available or, or present in the soil, right? And so we didn't see any differences. Uh, but I think that there are some products that are being applied at higher rates, uh, maybe foliar versus uh, seed treatment. And, and those would have a, a higher potential for um, increasing what's, you know, what's in that microbial community. Okay. The next one, uh, I know, noticed in your presentation, you talked some about the organic matter levels in the soil. And this question uh, asks, what would you consider to be a low organic matter level? Um, so this is going to be uh, kind of uh, site specific or state specific, right? Um, so in central Iowa, north central Iowa, if you have less than 3% organic matter, I would consider that low um, because we have places that are maybe even as high as 8% organic matter. Um, if I go to like Southern Iowa, you know, if you have one to 2%, one to 3% organic matter, that's pretty good um, because that's just naturally what, what we kind of have there, right? Um, and so kind of paying attention to that, generally speaking, I, I would categorize if you're less than maybe one and a half or two percent, that that gets us on the lower side of things. And definitely, if you're less than you know one percent, um, yeah, then I think there's maybe a little bit more potential for some of these products, just because we don't have the organic matter, we don't have the natural uh, microbial activity. Okay, so on your list of different uh, um, microbes, etc., there's quite a few of them. So. The next person I ask, are there any of these microbes that are invasive and not found in the soil? And could this create a native in uh, microbe imbalance guidance to monitor? Yeah, so I would say that generally speaking, a lot of these microbes are present at uh, various levels in the soil, um, or at least present within soils in the United States, um, generally speaking. Um, so you may have different, um, I'll call it ratios of various microbes. And so introduced versus native is really a key here. Um, and some of these are at low levels in the, in the soil um, microbial community because they, they are more preyed upon versus being the predator, you know, so to speak. And so I, I think we have to be careful because that microbial community um, is can always be in flux. And one of the better ways of changing it is through the diversity of, of crops that we have there. Introducing species, we're going to come back to some sort of a microbiome balance. And so some of these that are introduced uh, may not stay there very long just because um, that microbial community is already in balance. And so um, there, the, there is a potential that they're going to disappear. I think that the part that we have to be careful of is the, the introduced and do they become invasive, right? Um, and I don't think that, that we're really looking at that now because then we get into a whole, um, I'll, I'll tell you from a product testing standpoint, um, the USDA has, um, has strict um, things in place to prevent um, the invasives, you know, really to be introduced. And so a lot of these that are being tested have to have been proven that they're in the, the soil community already. They're not invasive. Okay. We have a couple more questions. Uh, the first one being, uh, is there any difference between in furrow versus on seed applications? And is one better than the other? Um, so I've only had the, that one product that I've tested with that. Um, so in furrow versus on seed. Um, in furrow, you're going to be able to put on higher rates. I think that's the biggest difference. Um, on the seed, you're putting on very low rates um, just because you can't 
you can't load up that seed too much, right? It's not going to go through the planter like like we want it to. Um, you know, so that's that's probably the biggest thing to watch out for is kind of the rates and do you want it on the seed or just right next to the seed? I don't personally. I don't think there's a difference. It's just how do you apply it, right? And in furrow, it means you have to have the setup, you know, to be able to do that. And so it may be more costly to uh, do in furrow if you're if you're having to add that to the planner. Okay. And then the final question that I have here in the box is: in your testing at ISU, have you ran a genomics test through Trace or BioMakers? And are those tests revealing? I have not. Um, I know I have a colleague that has, um, and we're still trying to, well, so put it this way, we took those samples in the fall of 2021, and that colleague is still trying to figure out what it means. So, uh, you know, and, and I would say that this is our first kind of foray into uh, that, or at least the first time I've known at Iowa State that they've kind of been uh, diving into that. Um, they were not looking at biologicals, so they were looking at different systems. So they were looking at kind of our, our traditional um, crop system versus a, a high residue, high cover crop use, you know, type system. So. Okay, well, th thank you, Mark. Uh, looks like we've answered all the questions that the participants have asked. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Jamie. Thank you very mar much, Mark. I appreciate that. I want to go ahead and share my screen again real quick. Okay, so we are going to go ahead and wrap up. I want to thank Dr. Mark Light for sharing all his information with us today. It was very informative. For those of you that are looking for your CCA credits, uh, we want to go ahead and stop the recording.